I know I opened Pandora's box by letting y'all get coffee, but we're going to get right back in it. And um, take it away, TJ. All right. As, he, as he may have mentioned, the title of my talk is the Mitigating Strength Retrogression Using Tailored Cement Designs. And uh, I don't know about y'all, but that wonderful lunch we just had made me a little bit sleepy. So I thought we would start off with a chemistry quiz for everyone. No, nah, just kidding. But uh, the, this is a pretty simplified chemical equation. It's you know, with Portland cement, as soon as you add water to it, over 200 chemical reactions initiate. So what I'm looking at here is just a very simplified version of how does temperature affect Portland cement. And so you have your C3S or your C2S, add your water, you add some heat. And it's generally accepted that <clears throat> 230 degrees is where the strength retrogression begins to occur, but I'm sure we all know that's more of a spectrum and just kind of an accepted temperature. So if you don't add any crystalline silica to this, you get into the bad zone. You start forming these crystalline phases that aren't good, the alpha calcium silicate hydrates and the hillebrandites, et cetera. And what those do <clears throat> typically is lead to higher permeabilities in your cement and the perm comes from more pore space, from denser crystals, etc. And this more higher pore space, higher permeability leads to a big decrease in your compressive strength. So in general, that's the pathway these things go. And historically, the way to prevent that is to add crystalline silica. So it, it bends your or turns your crystalline pathway in a, in a more favorable direction. You start going to Tobermorite and zonalite, et cetera. Um, which, in general, retains the properties you want to retain. Another way to look at that instead of a chemical reaction is uh, more like a chart. I have to use charts with the engineers I work with because they don't like to see chemical reactions, right? So, so this generally helps. Um, up here, on the x-axis, you have a calcium to silica ratio. And anything above about 1.8-ish, you get into that. Now, this is all for neat Portland cement, of course. You get into that bad zone. And temperatures on the y-axis, the higher you get, the worse it gets. But like the traditional method, if you get more crystalline silica in there, you can stay in this green zone, which, which retains your cement properties. and strengths, permeabilities, mechanical properties that you want, right? Now, the, the, the task we were given was to try to get similar results, but not use crystalline silica. The key word being crystalline here, take out the crystalline. So let's take a step back and kind of see why crystalline silica is used in the first place, in the oil field at least. Uh, it usually comes in the form of quartz. There's a bunch of other crystalline silicas, polymorphs, et cetera. But the ones we deal with in the oil field is almost always quartz. Uh, it's the second most abundant mineral on earth. So that makes it a very good low cost filler. And that's one of the main drivers for these applications in the oil field. It's been used as a weighting agent simply because its water requirement is really low. And you don't have to add as much water to have it in your slurry. It's used in spacers. And what we're looking at here, it's used for strength retrogression. And that really ties back to that previous bullet point of low cost. And it's functional. It works well, right? As long as you got the right concentrations in there. So going back to the task we were given, the reason, one of the main reasons we want to remove crystalline silica is to increase safety, to protect our employees, our customers, because a couple of years ago, OSHA came out with the new standards for respirable silica. So we're trying to pull it out as much as possible, maybe <clears throat> not make 100% replacement right away, but remove as much as we can. And that's the main, main goal here. You know, we always want to provide high performance cements, but we also want to have them 
be safe for our people to produce and use. So going back to that, those charts, thinking back to them, the calcium silica ratio is what plays the biggest role here. The crystalline silica, the reason crystalline is good, we could go into very long conversations on that, but it really boils down to the calcium silica ratio. And silica, thankfully, like that other bullet point, is one of the most abundant things on earth, and it's available in many, many different forms, right? You have quartz, you have zeolites, you have clays, you have rocks, uh, hydrogels, different gels, and amorphous. So we decided, why don't we just take a step away from anything that's crystalline and see if we can develop cements that don't strength retrogress, that are safer to use. <clears throat> and the way we got here was what we termed or, or we call physical chemical chemistry. And really we got these fancy words up here, physical chemical synergistic innovation. And what that really means is we wanted to step back and take a look at all the different available forms of silica and start quantifying them in a meaningful way and generate really what turned out to be a huge database of properties of different type of materials all over the world and start using those to innovate solutions um, to mitigate strength retrogression. And so that's pretty much where we've ended up. We can take not only those materials, but different techniques and uh, uh, different additives as well to, to tailor our cement and end up with greater properties all around. It can still be economical. And of course, like we were talking, we wanna protect employees and customers and preserve operational efficiencies in general. Now you kind of say, what is tailored cement? Well, I'm a chemist, right? And as y'all can probably tell, I'm a, my background's in silica chemistry. I'm a zeolite chemist. But this was not a, a singular effort. It was a entire company-wide effort pretty much. And the chemistry I talk about is just one part of it. There's a, a big data part, a computational part, a predictive algorithm part, all these things tied into that database part to help design these tailored cements that are not only useful for strength retrogression, but we can modify mechanical properties, slurry properties, a bunch of different things just by modifying or changing the types of silicas that we use. <clears throat> and of course, the proof is always in the pudding. So I put together a couple of experiments here to show you guys the um, successes that we've had. And as the control experiment, we took a class H cement, uh, but didn't put anything in it, just heated it up to 350, about 3000 PSI. We let it sit there for 14 days. And of course you see the uncontrolled strength retrogression. And this time right here was actually about 24 hours in here somewhere. So it, it retrogressed almost fully, very, very quickly. <clears throat> so this is one of our best laboratory scale attempts. And what we did here is we, we had the same class H cement. We used our new way to formulate these things with uh, certain types of silicas. None of it being crystalline, of course. Same conditions. Ran this one actually out to 75 days is when we lost power. We were shooting for 90 days, but uh, ended up at 75 days. And at that point, there was no significant strength retrogression at all. And of course, we go around showing it to our field engineers and they say, yeah, that's awesome. You can do that with these wonderful laboratory materials. But what I want to see real world stuff that I can talk to my customers about. So we took that as a challenge. And we've done this multiple times. This is just one example. We took an operationally executed slurry and the materials available from that location. We didn't pull materials from any other location. 
and we designed a slurry using these new materials, methods, and techniques, and ended up with the exact same results that we saw in the laboratory, at least out to 75 days, and for compressive strength measurements. No significant strength retrogression at all, which gave everyone a lot more confidence that it, it is a, a very, very good technique to control these strength retrogressions. And so, in summary, we have developed a way to tailor cements to mitigate strength retrogression without the need for any crystal and silica. And with that, I thank you. Over We're here. By Mr. Raphael. Thank you. TJ. Um, yes, sir. Maybe it's just me, a little old school. The one comment is uh, we were always told, hey, you got to use silica, crystalline silica. Mm -hmm. Amorphous silica is metastable at best. So it either reacts too fast or it doesn't react when you need it. And now you're basically looking at other sources of silica, including amorphous silica yes, to sir. render a stable slurry design or a solid monolithic cement sheath, just to sound smart. <laughs> now, uh, retrogression is, is good to control. We all agree to that. To some extent, retrogression is, isn't too bad as long as your permeability is not compromised. Do you have any data that shows that the effect of permeability, we all understand it's correlated to strength retrogression, but do you see any, any improvement? The fact that most likely you have smaller particles of, uh, of silica in your system that will show that it's a better overall cement system. I should have counted on you to ask such a great question. <laughs> but uh, short answer is we haven't really run any permeability tests per se in the, with the high temperature designs, but Slurries designed at lower temperatures that haven't gone through strength retrogression always have an order of magnitude lower permeability, or almost always, I should say. Again, that's not going up to strength retrogression temperatures, but versus conventional cements, there are always much lower permeabilities. And in general, that's based on particle size packing, et cetera, stuff like that. Thank you. Any other questions? Right here. Quick question, um, density range, and then also 350 looks great. What about four, five, six, seven hundred 700 degrees? Have any tests been thought about or done at those higher These are all really proof of concept studies. And basically what you see here is what we got as far as time length and temperature. Yeah. Um, and what was the first part of your question? I'm sorry. Um, density range. Density range, these, we have stuck around 14 pounds which was just um, a natural medium for us. So we've gone down to probably 12 and a half up to maybe 15 and a half, something like that. So I've looked at like down to 11 and a half with, with fume silica in the past and it gave some temporary strength, but then it got real squirrely and, and I just walked away from it. But yeah, there's still some I think there's some opportunity. I just didn't have the resources at the time to pursue yeah, it. That's a great comment because at the outset of putting a project proposal together for this, we asked, what's the time limit that everybody accepts as, as far as being able to prevent it? And we got times ranges from 90 days out to three years, right? Yeah, so and there's so sure. I mean, it, the crystallization never stops, right? It's a pathway. It's always changing. It's hydrothermal. You're, you're eventually going to get to some um, thermodynamic well, but that's going to years and years and years in the future. And, and that's one of the things we struggled with. And I'll take any advice from anybody in the crowd is we ended up settling on doing a year long study as the max, because that's about what our equipment and resources can handle. Yeah, I mean, all that was accounted for in our design of experiments. We just haven't got to it. We got to do it yet. Yeah. 
Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask about, um, you said it's not or it is amorphous silica, I, I missed that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in general, yes, it's a, amorphous types of silica. Okay, so in cement and, co I mean, in concrete research, uh, alkali silica reaction uh, mm -hmm. happens with this amorphous silica. Do, do you think that would be a problem or it would actually be maybe a positive in this uh, application? Actually, uh, Columbia University and their civil engineering department put out a great study a couple of years ago showing that once you get your particles below 100 mesh, the ASR is not a factor anymore. And we very rarely deal with silicas above 100 mesh. Other questions? Um, so, um, with the, I also did some experiments with uh, cement with silica, and my experience is that although it increases the strength, it generally reduces the toughness. So, which is like the you know the resistance to cracking or fracturing. So, have you seen anything on those lines? Man, you guys are a tough crowd. You know, a lot of these things I'm not supposed to talk about, but the we have seen the exact opposite. Uh, like I said, through the computer modeling and the predictive algorithms, we can actually make tougher cements with higher compressive strengths and lower compressive strength cements that are tougher than the higher compressive strength, brittle cements. So um, yeah, it, we, we've been able to overcome that part of the challenge, at least in general. Anybody else? All righty. Well, thanks, TJ. Thank you. So with that, we will conclude session two and uh, take a short coffee break. And in session three, we'll get on and going. Our geothermal technologies office has been investing in developing and deploying geothermal for decades. And we've asked Congress for 57 million more dollars for this program in the upcoming year. This is the Allen S. King coal-fired power station. It produces 600 megawatts of steady, reliable base load power. Shutting down this power station is the right thing to do as we've got to stop burning fossil fuels and save our Earth. The problem is, we can't replace this power with just wind and solar. In California, 
The Public Utilities Commission has finally and formally recognised this problem and has now called for 1100 megawatts of firm and renewable 24-7 electricity generation by 2026. That's geothermal energy. We're learning from both uh, successes at the state level, like last year's California Public Utilities Commission procurement decision, that geothermal rising helped to boost. And we're learning from our international work, obviously like Europe's progress on district heating systems. In April, we announced $15 million for geothermal research projects in West Virginia as part of our investments in job creation and economic opportunities in the hard hit coal and power plant communities area. WVU Morganton campus has been identified as a priority location for deep direct use geothermal project. Therefore, to perform a geothermal resource quantification and risk assessment, an exploratory well will be drilled to a depth of 15,000 feet along with a full logging and coding program. We'll be using state-of-the-art te drilling technologies for this exploratory well. The project will have implications beyond West Virginia University campus. It will provide data for geothermal resources for other potential sites in the middle Appalachian Basin that has similar geology and demonstrate geothermal energy is a national resource but not limited to Western states. Department of Energy sees geothermal as a crucial tool to help us tackle the climate crisis, to deliver 40% of the benefits of clean energy to disadvantaged communities, and to build a skilled, diverse energy workforce. The newly formed Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Task Force has been very busy since we formed seven months ago. Our first goal was to create a DEI statement that shows Geothermal Rising's commitment to improving diversity, equity and inclusion across the geothermal community. Geothermal Rising is committed to improving diversity, equity, and inclusion to provide a brighter future for Earth and all its inhabitants. Our organization and community embrace and celebrate our members' differences. It is a responsibility of Geothermal Rising to encourage and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a global geothermal nonprofit organization, we are committed to connecting the geothermal community. There is more work to be done, and as we expand across markets and internationally, Geothermal Rising will continue to seek equitable improvement to elevate the geothermal community. The infrastructure investments that are in President Biden's Build Back Better agenda are going to turbocharge geothermal energy in America. We're talking about the biggest investment in clean energy and transmission in history. So my message to you is this, when it comes to geothermal, America is open for business. We are so ready to partner with you to get this done. We are grateful for your tireless work to elevate this important, clean and reliable energy source. And we're grateful for your willingness to train the next generation of geothermal professionals. And we are excited to secure policy wins all across the country. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I hope you have a fantastic conference. Our geothermal technologies office has been investing in developing and deploying geothermal for decades. And we've asked Congress for 57 million more dollars for this program in the upcoming year. This is the Allen S. King coal-fired power station. It produces 600 megawatts of steady, reliable baseload power. Shutting down this power station is the right thing to do as we've got to stop burning fossil fuels and save our Earth. The problem is, we can't replace this power with just wind and solar. In California, the Public Utilities Commission has finally and formally recognised this problem 
and has now called for 1100 megawatts of firm and renewable 24-7 electricity generation by 2026. That's geothermal energy. We're learning from both uh, successes at the state level, like last year's California Public Utilities Commission procurement decision, that geothermal rising helped to boost. And we're learning from our international work, obviously like Europe's progress on district heating systems. In April, we announced $15 million for geothermal research projects in West Virginia as part of our investments in job creation and economic opportunities in the hard hit coal and power plant communities area. WVU Morganton campus has been identified as a priority location for deep direct use geothermal project. Therefore, to perform a geothermal resource quantification and risk assessment, an exploratory well will be drilled by a depth of 15,000 feet, along with a full logging and coding program. We'll be using state-of-the-art te drilling technologies for this exploratory well. The project will have implications beyond West Virginia University campus. It will provide data for geothermal resources for other potential sites in the middle Appalachian Basin that has similar geology and demonstrate geothermal energy is a national resource but not compared to Western states. Department of Energy sees geothermal as a crucial tool to help us tackle the climate crisis, to deliver 40% of the benefits of clean energy to disadvantaged communities and to build a skilled, diverse energy workforce. The newly formed Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Task Force has been very busy since we formed seven months ago. Our first goal was to create a DEI statement that shows Geothermal Rising's commitment to improving diversity, equity and inclusion across the geothermal community. Geothermal Rising is committed to improving diversity, equity and inclusion to provide a brighter future for Earth and all its inhabitants. Our organization and community embrace and celebrate our members' differences. It is a responsibility of Geothermal Rising to encourage and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a global geothermal nonprofit organization, we are committed to connecting the geothermal community. There is more work to be done, and as we expand across markets and internationally, Geothermal Rising will continue to seek equitable improvement to elevate the geothermal community. The infrastructure investments that are in President Biden's Build Back Better agenda are going to turbocharge geothermal energy in America. We're talking about the biggest investment in clean energy and transmission in history. So my message to you is this. When it comes to geothermal, America is open for business. We are so ready to partner with you to get this done. We are grateful for your tireless work to elevate this important, clean and reliable energy source. And we're grateful for your willingness to train the next generation of geothermal professionals. And we are excited to secure policy wins all across the country. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I hope you have a fantastic conference. Our geothermal technologies office has been investing in developing and deploying geothermal for decades. And we've asked Congress for 57 million more dollars for this program in the upcoming year. This is the Allen S. King coal-fired power station. It produces 600 megawatts of steady, reliable baseload power. Shutting down this power station is the right thing to do as we've got to stop burning fossil fuels and save our Earth. The problem is, we can't replace this power with just wind and solar. In California, the Public Utilities Commission has finally and formally recognized this problem and has now called for 1100 megawatts of firm 
and renewable 24-7 electricity generation by 2026. That's geothermal energy. We're learning from both uh, successes at the state level, like last year's California Public Utilities Commission procurement decision, that geothermal rising helped to boost. And we're learning from our international work, obviously like Europe's progress on district heating systems. In April, we announced $15 million for geothermal research projects in West Virginia as part of our investments in job creation and economic opportunities in the hard hit coal and power plant communities area. WVU Morganton campus has been identified as a priority location for deep direct use geothermal project. Therefore, to perform a geothermal resource quantification and risk assessment, an exploratory well will be drilled to a depth of 15,000 feet, along with a full logging and coding program. We'll be using state-of-the-art te drilling technologies for this exploratory well. The project will have implications beyond West Virginia University campus. It will provide data for geothermal resources for other potential sites in the middle Appalachian Basin that has similar geology and demonstrate geothermal energy is a national resource, but not limited to Western states. Department of Energy sees geothermal as a crucial tool to help us tackle the climate crisis, to deliver 40% of the benefits of clean energy to disadvantaged communities and to build a skilled, diverse energy workforce. The newly formed Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Task Force has been very busy since we formed seven months ago. Our first goal was to create a DEI statement that shows Geothermal Rising's commitment to improving diversity, equity and inclusion across the geothermal community. Geothermal Rising is committed to improving diversity, equity and inclusion to provide a brighter future for Earth and all its inhabitants. Our organization and community embrace and celebrate our members' differences. It is a responsibility of Geothermal Rising to encourage and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a global geothermal nonprofit organization, we are committed to connecting the geothermal community. There is more work to be done, and as we expand across markets and internationally, Geothermal Rising will continue to seek equitable improvement to elevate the geothermal community. The infrastructure investments that are in President Biden's Build Back Better agenda are going to turbocharge geothermal energy in America. We're talking about the biggest investment in clean energy and transmission in history. So my message to you is this. When it comes to geothermal, America is open for business. We are so ready to partner with you to get this done. We are grateful for your tireless work to elevate this important, clean and reliable energy source. And we're grateful for your willingness to train the next generation of geothermal professionals. And we are excited to secure policy wins all across the country. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I hope you have a fantastic conference. Our geothermal technologies office has been investing in developing and deploying geothermal for decades. And we've asked Congress for 57 million more dollars for this program in the upcoming year. This is the Allen S. King coal-fired power station. It produces 600 megawatts of steady, reliable baseload power. Shutting down this power station is the right thing to do as we've got to stop burning fossil fuels and save our Earth. The problem is, we can't replace this power with just wind and solar. In California, the Public Utilities Commission has finally and formally recognized this problem and has now called for 1,100 megawatts of firm and renewable 24-7 electricity generation by 2026. That's geothermal energy. We're learning 
from both uh, successes at the state level, like last year's California Public Utilities Commission procurement decision that geothermal rising helped to boost. And we're learning from our international work, obviously like Europe's progress on district heating systems. In April, we announced $15 million for geothermal research projects in West Virginia as part of our investments in job creation and economic opportunities in the hard hit coal and power plant communities area. WVU Morganton campus has been identified as a priority location for deep direct use geothermal project. Therefore, to perform a geothermal resource quantification and risk assessment, an exploratory well will be drilled by a depth of 15,000 feet, along with a full logging and coding program. We'll be using state-of-the-art tech drilling technologies for this exploratory well. The project will have implications beyond West Virginia University campus. It will provide data for geothermal resources for other potential sites in the middle Appalachian Basin that has similar geology and demonstrate geothermal energy is a national resource but not limited to Western states. Department of Energy sees geothermal as a crucial tool to help us tackle the climate crisis, to deliver 40% of the benefits of clean energy to disadvantaged communities and to build a skilled, diverse energy workforce. The newly formed Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Task Force has been very busy since we formed seven months ago. Our first goal was to create a DEI statement that shows Geothermal Rising's commitment to improving diversity, equity and inclusion across the geothermal community. Geothermal Rising is committed to improving diversity, equity and inclusion to provide a brighter future for Earth and all its inhabitants. Our organization and community embrace and celebrate our members' differences. It is a responsibility of Geothermal Rising to encourage and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a global geothermal nonprofit organization, we are committed to connecting the geothermal community. There is more work to be done, and as we expand across markets and internationally, Geothermal Rising will continue to seek equitable improvement to elevate the geothermal community. The infrastructure investments that are in President Biden's Build Back Better agenda are going to turbocharge geothermal energy in America. We're talking about the biggest investment in clean energy and transmission in history. So my message to you is this. When it comes to geothermal, America is open for business. We are so ready to partner with you to get this done. We are grateful for your tireless work to elevate this important, clean and reliable energy source. And we're grateful for your willingness to train the next generation of geothermal professionals. And we are excited to secure policy wins all across the country. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I hope you have a fantastic conference. Our geothermal technologies office has been investing in developing and deploying geothermal for decades. And we've asked Congress for 57 million more dollars for this program in the upcoming year. This is the Allen S. King coal-fired power station. It produces 600 megawatts of steady, reliable baseload power. Shutting down this power station is the right thing to do as we've got to stop burning fossil fuels and save our Earth. The problem is, we can't replace this power with just wind and solar. In California, the Public Utilities Commission has finally and formally recognized this problem and has now called for 1,100 megawatts of firm and renewable 24-7 electricity generation by 2026. That's geothermal energy. We're learning 
from both uh, successes at the state level, like last year's California Public Utilities Commission procurement decision that geothermal rising helped to boost. And we're learning from our international work, obviously like Europe's progress on district heating systems. In April, we announced $15 million for geothermal research projects in West Virginia as part of our investments in job creation and economic opportunities in the hard hit coal and power plant communities area. WVU Morganton campus has been identified as a priority location for deep direct use geothermal project. Therefore, to perform a geothermal resource quantification and risk assessment, an exploratory well will be drilled by a depth of 15,000 feet. Yeah, I know about the full logging and yeah, that's why I don't want to. Uh...
All right, let's get back to class. Um, so this is the last session and uh, we have some good news. It's going to be shorter than planned. So, but you're not going to get away. We'll have a good uh, discussion on summarizing all the points from today so that we can actually write them up and have something at the end of this uh, workshop. Uh, Sam and I are going to uh, share this uh, discussion at the end. Um, and it will be really your points on what you learned or what your takeaways are from the sessions that we heard today. The first and probably the only speaker is Daniel Burr. Again, Daniel, <laughs> are you ready? Yeah. We are going to uh, hear about high temperature and uh, high pressure cements in general. That's the title of the session. And the uh, title of the talk is Cement Replacement System for HPHT High Stress Applications. Sam, anything to add? So I think so what we have been discussing so far and the topic of our whole workshop is high pressure, high temperature. Plus that adds one more, you know, that's normally what we hear in oil and gas also, but we add the geothermal aspect to it. So that makes it high pressure, high temperature, geothermal cementing. And I think so Daniel has vast loads of experience on actually applying, researching and applying things. So without further ado, I would invite Daniel to take the stage. I think he's already presented what he does and who he is. So I'll let him take over from there. Thank you. Yeah, now we're live. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to say there's been some very interesting papers so far today, and I've learned a lot. And I think there's a lot of creative thinking uh, going on, and that's very exciting and encouraging. Um, so a little background, maybe. Uh, I was working on an HPHT, super HPHT uh, uh, oil and gas well, and uh, looking at all the accompanying challenges associated with that of maintaining uh, zonal isolation. It was a high pressure gas well, um, keeping it from failing mechanically, preventing loss circulation. And um, I came across a, a system that's, I would qualify it as out of the box. Um, and that's what I wanted to present to you. And, and I've looked at it and it's really got me thinking. It, it causes me to continue to think about what are alternative solutions to achieve not a good cement job, but achieve zonal isolation? So that's where um, that was kind of the impetus for me thinking about this. So my uh, co-author is uh, Vader Rig from Flow Patrol, and he's um, one of the co-inventors of the product that I'm going to be talking about. So we'll basically do a, a, re, uh, a review of Portland cement, which we all know about now and talked about a lot talk about its capabilities, but also its deficiencies. And we'll talk about uh, performance testing of a new system and uh, its uh, capabilities. So we all know Portland cement, high compressive strength, low cost, readily available. You mix it in water, abracadabra, you've got something hard behind your casing. And that's great. There's a plethora of, of additives that you can use to mix it from a specific gravity of one to 2.6 rheology, fluid loss, et cetera. It's very well understood and everyone knows about it, but we also know about all of its, um, the challenges associated with extremely high stress conditions. Deficiencies, uh, 
qualitative of variability, you know, one cement isn't the same as the next. There's going to be variations. You always have to test a given retarder with a given cement for a given cement job to make sure it's going to work. Uh, it's chemically susceptible to degradation in the presence of uh, well, CO2 and water, which we see a lot in geothermal wells. Temperature limitations up to 400 degrees C, which, you know, that covers most of it, but it's still a limitation. Thermal stability, we need to add silica flour, et cetera. Um, we also have generally poor mechanical properties. It's brittle. It'll crack under stress, and we study it, and we try and improve it, but we're tr still trying to improve something that isn't very good to start with for, for our particular application. Um, we have hydration volume reduction when the cement sets. There's poor pressure loss inside the cement. A lot of complex things that makes life difficult, I'll put it that way. And then on top of that, there can be contamination with other fluids uh, during placement. So we've all seen these pictures before, the mechanical properties. Some other deficiencies, it's testing intensive. Um, when we get into high temperatures, we first got to figure out what the temperature is that we're going to test it at. And then we've got to be able to get it to remain fluid long enough at our bottom hole circulating temperature. But then we want to get drilling out as soon as possible afterwards. So we want it to set up as quick as possible. Um, we have to wait for it to cement, set up. And then we've got to get it placed. We've got uh, to run all kinds of tests on it. And I spent my career doing this. So I know what they are, fluid loss, thickening time compressive strength, rheology, fan viscometer, um, all these tests required for, uh, to get a proper design, which keeps a lot of labs busy, but um, it's a lot of work. So long-term outlook, currently primary material used for well abandonment and regulatory requirements written with Portland Cement and Mine. There's long-term durability issues. We can put this in a well and say it's good for the, you know, the rest of the history of the earth, but the fact is it could crack and there's long-term, you know, potential risks there. There's growing concern over global warming and anthropogenic CO2 emissions, which Portland Cement is a great contributor to. Great maybe isn't the right word. Um, when we'll need a compelling case to force industry to change current practices. So what could we do? There's a material that's been, was developed in the North Sea area to abandon wells. Its original uh, name was Sandaban. It's a mixture of sand and water. And there's, so I'll first of all, I'll describe it, and then I'll give you some of it, the advantages of using this material. So the, the basic concept is you take a particle size distribution of sand, and you calculate the volume of water it's gonna take to fill the interstitial spaces, and you mix those together, and you get this particular product. So 15% by weight, of the material is water and the other 85% is sand. And it's highly viscous, but um, the unique properties of that is there's always particle to particle contact even when it's in, it, in its normal state. So it can never settle because the particles are always in contact. Um, the density is around 2.15. Um, or 17.9 pounds per gallon. So it's rather heavy. The unique properties is it's temperature independent. You bring it out to location, doesn't matter if your well is 80 degrees or 500 degrees, use the same, same material. Single bled, use at all temperatures. You don't have to test it in the laboratory because it's never gonna set up anyway, so who cares? Um, it's can experience, this is one of the things that attracted me to it. You can, at least theoretically, have it go through cyclic stress loading. And again, it's never gonna crack because it never set up in the first place. So all you would do is expand and contract your casing. And at least theoretically, the sand grains would always remain in contact with the pipe. So, um, and that's been verified in tests and it's actually been field tested. They, they put it in a well, it was originally designed for abandonment. They put it in a well to temporarily abandon it for I believe a year and a half. Um, they came back after a year and a half, instead of having to drill it out, they just washed through it and it worked just fine. Um, another unique feature of this particular material is it seals law circulation. So while it is very heavy, 
and there may be some concerns about that. Um, if it flows into a uh, existing fracture, the, it's been seen that it will actually seal that fracture off because the particle pack is so tight, there's no fluid leak off out of the system. So it immediately seals off that fracture and can be circulated past it. So seals law circulation zones, doesn't need to be tested, can be cyclically loaded without failure. Those things sounded really good to me. Um, no mixing required on site. That's kind of a, a blessing and a, and a challenge. Um, the good news is you don't have to mix it on site. And the bad news is you have to bring it all out there and shear it before you actually pump it into a well. So that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, another great advantage of the system is it's not calcium silicate. So guess what? You can put CO2 next to it. You can put H2S next to it and it's not gonna corrode away or go away. Um, plugs can be, if you use it as a plugging material, you can just circulate out the plug whenever you want or the well will be considered abandoned permanently if you leave it in place. Low permeability, they've tested it with uh, in annular conditions with, for gas flow. And because of the, the particle size distribution, there's essentially zero permeable flow through this material. And guess what? It also doesn't shrink. There's no hydration volume reduction. So the benefits, um, again, because it's, it is very viscous, which is good news and bad news. Um, the good news is it's very good at displacing fluids ahead of it because it is so viscous. It's non-hazardous. It does, you don't generate any CO2 in the production of it. Uh, minimal carbon footprint, long-term stability, thermal stability, bonds to steel. And we've actually run additional tests, but I can't share those at this, mo at this point, but there's other benefits associated with this particular product. So deficiencies, it's one size fits all. Specific gravity is very high. You can drop it a little bit. Um, I would think if we needed to, we, we might find ways of tweaking this particular formulation, but it was a one size fits all and used for plug and abandonment. Special storage is required for the system. Again, that's good and bad. I mean, you could actually, as we thought about it, we've seen that we can probably put this in ready mix mixers and bring it out to location and have it shear and then just pump it down hole. Um, so there has to be some type of pre-stirring before you go down hole. When, when you get the material after it's sat for a long time, you can walk on it. I mean, you don't have to be Jesus to walk on this stuff. You can just walk across it and it's fine. But after you shear it and they've got some videos online that you can watch it. I don't have one with me now, but you can shear this and fluidize it. Once you fluidize it, you can pump it with regular cementing pumping equipment. Um, what else? Yeah, requires a, some type of, if, if you're using it for plug and abandonment, you'll either need Portland cement set below it or some other plug. But my thought is what if we use this in an HPHT, either oil and gas well or geothermal well in an annulus, what advantages could be realized? And as I just said there, I think there's a, a significant number of them. Uh, the, the challenges, it's um, high viscosity, um, probably needs to be studied a little bit more, especially at higher temperatures. Um, I think there may be some unique things going on with the thermal expansion of the water and, and, and the solids. I wanna make sure, I wanna make sure that on the way down, it, it stays fluid in a, in a particular case, but that can be looked at readily pretty easily. Um, another, I don't know if it's a deficiency, but once you stop moving it, it develops shear resistance rapidly. So failure is not an option and shutting down the pumps during displacement is also not an option. Um, additional testing needed for HPHD conditions to ensure that this material remains pumpable when volumetric changes occur in the water phase, which I guess I just mentioned that. Performance testing, QC testing probably needs to be done on the premixed blends before shipping to location. Um, almost all ordinary Portland cement testing required prior to a cement job are not needed. That's um, actually an advantage because again, it's never sets up and we probably know the general viscosity of all of, of this one system. 
So application history, it's been used in primary cementing one, in one particular well. It's also been used as a abandonment product. I also know it's been recently used in uh, Colorado as a, a, a simple abandonment system where they can just pump it into a well and, and walk away from it and it's working very well. Here's a particular paper for anyone interested. Um, I can, you can either look it up or I can send you probably a, well, I can't send you a copy, but you can look it up and, and get a copy of the paper if you're interested for plugging applications. Temporary, as I mentioned, it temporarily suspended a well at, at when they wanted to re-enter the well. Instead of drilling out cement for hours or days, they just washed through it and got about their business. Oh. Oh, come on. Application method could probably be used for, especially the large casing applications we're talking about um, with the large annulus to start with, could be used either in tandem with regular Portland cement or could be used by itself. Depends on how, how daring you are. But you could easily put cement around the shoe and put this stuff as a lead. So conclusions. Use of conventional Portland cement has many deficiencies and challenges associated with them. Temperature modeling, thermal stability, mechanical durability, exhaustive testing, and then still the, the uh, on-site application of the material, susceptibility to corrosion. This particular material is promising uh, alternative. It's durable and it's simple. Many other advantages over uh, regular Portland cement but it will require some additional work. So this is my out of the box, um, something to make you think differently. Um, I don't know if anyone's ready to stand up and run this tomorrow, but I think we need to start thinking about alternatives to Portland cement. And this is maybe one we're thinking about. That's all I have. Thanks very much. There probably to be no questions on this. Any questions for Daniel? The one that he's left the genie, he just pulled it out of the box and left it for you all to think. <laughs> so as you all start thinking, questions are welcome. Okay. Don't let Bill ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, very interesting. Uh, how do you think it supports the casing? I think it will actually very well because when you stop moving it, it develops a tremendous amount of shear resistance. And we've actually had some studies done in Australia by a rheologist. And uh, if, if you calculate surface area and shear resistance, you'll find it's, 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 it's more than enough. Yeah, but a good question, a very good question. Really good stuff, I really like it. I like thinking outside the box. Uh, so have you done any permeability to both gas and uh, water? What am I yes, like? the original people have. It's, it's, fully, uh, it's been fully vetted for use in North Sea as an abandoned material. And it, it went through the paces to resist both gas and I think water flow. And I think the, uh, the suppliers of the product can, could pr provide you with that data. Thank you. So, Daniel, uh, yes, I have a question Sorry. about the um, pressure solution. So this is basically a silica sand, right? Yep. And at high temperature, particularly, but even at low temperature, silica dissolves under pressure at contact of the grains. Is it going to reprecipitate silica and become a solid eventually? I mean, is that that's a very good question we worry about okay yeah <laughs> are uh, there any other questions before we are there are any the other questions question? <laughs> <laughs> no susan um <laughs> no don't let susan ask any more questions no um i so think that's a really good question. question i was thinking more for for general application um as we get into the geothermal temperatures for all the advantages out there i think it, we could get somebody to run that test and by the way, the, also the water concentration is really low to start with. So the amount of silica that could re-precipitate, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm thinking as I'm just standing here. So even if it re-precipitated and you went through a thermal cycle, if you broke those bonds, you would still have probably essentially the same mixture, I think. 
although the smaller particles would probably dissolve first. And so there may be a slight increase in permeability. So maybe that's something that should be looked at. That's, that's my on the spot answer. All right, Daniel. Okay. Got a question for you. Oh, so a little bit of a follow, of a follow up oh. of Nicholas's question. If it doesn't set up, how does it really bond to the pipe? And two, are there any concerns of water segregation and high temperatures? Not like anybody in the room has never seen an annulus cook and boil mm. water um, and with all the detrimental effects of that. Yeah. So two questions. The one, the bonding is once you stop moving it, it develops a tremendous amount of shear resistance. Like we've done the calculations for gas migration, gel strength. We're talking probably thousands of pounds per hundred square foot of shear resistance. So it is not a, a chemical bond to the pipe, but I think, well, mathematically, I know that there's enough shear resistance to hold the pipe in place. And then the other question was about segregation. So that's, again, they've designed it where there's a minimal amount of water, only enough to fill the interstitial spaces, but not enough to actually float the particles apart. So because that's the case, there shouldn't be any segregation because it is, I mean, you can fluidize it, but when it stops moving, it doesn't then segregate out. It's still particle to particle contact. So I may have to look at what's the thermal expansion of the water at 500 degrees. And maybe there's a little bit there, room for some segregation, but in theory, at least there shouldn't be. So that's, that's the answer. And maybe it needs to be verified. Okay, Daniel, there is one question oh. here online. Um, if this is plugging the fractures, then uh, is that uh, a problem? And does it mean that it can only be used on pipe down, but not below the top of the productive interval? Um, so I think to address the first part, um, yeah, we're tip, if we're cementing across fractures, we usually want to seal them off. So we're not wanting to produce through them. So for a geothermal well, normally we uh, don't cement across, across productive zones because we don't want to plug them up with cement. So this would be the same case if we put it, say, against a surface or intermediate casing. If we plug the fractures, we should all be happy and I don't see any downside to that. And then the second part of it, can it be used deeper? Because of that, doesn't mean that it can only be used on the pipe down, uh, but not below the top of the productive. So it's all, you already answered that. Yeah. Okay. Bill, you got a question? Sorry, who? Bill doesn't get to answer. Any. No. Uh, okay. I have to do. I have to do something. So okay. <laughs> this is seventeen point five pound per gallon. Yeah. And straight. Silica sand is like uh, 19 and a half pounds. Yep. So there's only two pounds of water per, per gallon. Yep. So there ain't much water in this. That's the point. It's all. Yeah. Yep. What do you think? Have you thought about using it for loss circulation plugs? Yep. And what do you think? I think it'd be great. <laughs> How's that for short? <laughs> no, I, I really, Bill, I really do think um, it, it would be worth trying. They, they've actually had an application where they had uh, an existing loss zone and they never skipped a beat and they circulated this heavyweight material right past it. So it gives me some confidence. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, for the last question here, it's Bob. Hey, Bob. Howdy, Daniel. Uh, um, and with, with your extended answers, <laughs> um, um, what about pumpability in tight annuli, let's say between pipe and pipe for uh, uh, P and A's and is it appropriate for reverse circulation? Um, I'll start with the easy one first. Reverse, I think it's great um, because you're not ever having to lift it. So then you are greatly reducing your ECD. In the tight annular spaces, I still think we need to understand the rheology better. We, I know we did some uh, preliminary work on rheology, but it is 
it's measurable, but it's very high. And I don't think we've got our, our arms completely around what the reality is, especially as a function. So I would be, I would certainly not use it as a, on a first case scenario in a tight annular space. I'd, but in geothermal 13 and three eighths and 17 and a half inch hole, like all day long, that'd be great. Okay, so let's, let's give Daniel a big round of applause for the whole day that he has taken time and for answering the questions. Okay, so with that, we come to the end of the session for the first day. But now, since we've got time, what I would like to do is take this time, probably about half an hour or 45 minutes, to be able to summarize what were the three discussions that we had today and what we take back from it. I think so I'll take the clue again from where uh, Daniel was talking about thinking outside the box. I would like to add something to that. Certainly when thinking outside the box comes in, it becomes where you start your research. That's what we were just discussing today with some of the new technologies. And then as we research those new technologies, you have to go to the next step of a proof of a concept. The third thing is from a proof of concept, you go to the stage where you apply it in the field. And as you go through the circle, after you apply it in the field, you learn things from it, you refine your process and improve it again. Or if you have had failures, which was also spoken about, we look at what were the causes of failure, can we fix it or do we have to find another way around it? So with that in mind, so the first discussion that we had today, the first session was on the function of cement in well construction, where, where it was, the three discussions were, one, the first paper was about cementing super hot geothermal wells in the 21st century. You know, we have been, just as a additional information or discussion on that, we have been traditionally thinking of conventional geothermal where you know, we would be looking at temperatures and depths that will be called conventional. Then now, as you heard all during the conference that we had, the geothermal rising, we have now started stretching the limits of that conventional. And as Lou was talking earlier, we went from dry rock, now we call it enhanced geothermal systems. Here you're going deeper, you are looking at encountering higher temperatures, now, how will cement that is to be placed in those wells, which have to pretty much meet the same requirements, how will the cement be effective in 400 degrees centigrade? Or even some people are talking of going higher. You know, currently, whatever cement we have, 200, 250 degrees centigrade, then it starts a different route or a different journey. So this is something that we talk about. Then the second uh, discussion was, is the casing cement bonding the key for geothermal well integrity? And that was Caitlin who presented that. And then the third one was cement formation, shear bond strength evaluation that was presented by Aparita. So here, I would like to just throw this open to the for discussion, focusing on two things. One is these applications that we heard all during the day. How can these be applied to geothermal in future wells? Number one. And number two, whatever we spoke today, do you all think of some additional research that can be done in the field of cementing, which would be useful for both conventional geothermal and the EGS we are talking about? Let me repeat those questions once again. Can the applications that we discussed today be applied with probably some more refinement for future geothermal, that's number one. And you all might have certainly discussed or thought about things that we did not discuss today, which could be the next step in research for geothermal. I would like to throw it open to the audience. So this is the first session that we had. We'll discuss this for about 10 minutes and then go to the second session and the third session.
the floor is open please so i guess the 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 point was did we generate any new questions that we need to look into in terms of r d for any of the topics that we covered uh, this uh, in the first session um as a summary for all of us to have something to take take away sorry about that it's tough getting old um so from what i've heard and this is all great stuff one of the things i'm seeing is that we are looking at some new systems, some things that haven't been tried before. And what we're gonna need to do is some testing. And we're gonna need to do testing in conditions that as closely can match what we expect to have in these high temperature wells. And so do we, the, the question I'm asking and, and where I see this all consolidating is, do we have the right to test equipment? Is it available to us to do these kinds of tests? It, you know, are, can we um, test the whole system, the, the rock, uh, cement, casing system, casing connections, things like that, to see how well the data we collect matches any modeling we're doing so that we can verify our models. This is really, I think, one of the key issues with these, you know, we want to make these innovations, we want to make them work but people don't want to try them unless they've got some you know, real evidence that it's gonna be fine in their well and it's gonna really help their completion. Thank you. If I may add to just what Thank Susan said, I have been in discussions recently and gone, sometimes it is a big presentation. And by the time you come to the end of the presentation, sometimes it looks like this well has been actually drilled and the cement has been placed and tested. Okay, that's what it looks like at the end of it. But then sometimes I got very intrigued to ask, where did you drill this well? Because somebody told me in India, you've drilled a well and we have hit so much and so and so and done. So I said, by the way, I also did my studies there back home and I realized some places that I asked, where did you actually do this well or drill this well? Sam, by the way, but this wasn't done in our lab. I think so, I, that's where I go in agreement with what Susan was telling. Modeling is good enough until not, you know, that's fine in the research, that's a part of modeling. But the proof of concept comes when you actually test it in the well, in downhole conditions, and then see how it reacts. Certainly modeling can be done, I'm not against that, but certain testing it in the ground makes the biggest difference. Any takers from the research side or from to answer that? Here comes one. Yeah, I've been disconnected from the geothermal field for at least the last 10 years. But the one thing I would like to see or I have not seen enough, maybe it's out there, we tend to focus on the long-term stability of our cement systems cement sheath, you know, the added silica and whatnot. But I think we also need to focus on placement of cement at high temperatures. Do we have the right additives, the right polymers that do not hydrolyze as we're pumping and destabilizing our slurries? Because in general, when we talk about high temperature cement, we're talking about the cement once it's placed and we want a durability of a certain extended period of time but we do focus little on placement, placement challenges at high temperature. Even though in some wells we can pump a thousand barrels of water to cool it down, still uh, placing at high temperature, placement at high, at high temperature, I think is something we really need to focus on, especially now that I'm hearing, and maybe Daniel's uh, solution here is in the, going in the right direction. There's also lime silica cement systems out there that are good for, uh, uh, temperatures north of 400, 400F. But anyway, I'd like to see more of that. Again, I'm a casing equipment guy now, but uh, it would be nice to see that. Thank you. Thank you. And to look. Yeah, some exercise. 
The other thing, you know, I agree with you, placement is very important. And, and in geothermal and in many oil and gas operations where the, the formation is, is very pressure sensitive, uh, you know, geothermal, most of, the, most of the geothermal resources are all sub hydrostatic. So we're constantly losing circulation. Placement is difficult. We need to talk and has, we haven't talked very much about how do we lighten the weight of cement, but not lose the compressive strength and the, and the, and the bonding of the cement, you know. Up until now, we've been using, you know, inert materials like a perlite or something like that to lighten the cement, or you know, it's it um, foam cement. Uh, we've been using foam cement, but are we getting the right bonding with foam cement? I, my, I, my question is, foam cement works great. We get it in place, but I don't think we're getting the bonding and compressive strength necessary for a good cement bond. And I think we need to talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, foam cementing. I've done a lot of foam cementing, and uh, it, it's one of the things that I that, that that's my point too. Is uh, but foam cementing you can use. I worked with a guy who claimed he could tell the difference between water and foamed cement. And the GDO was just starting to work on that when the GDO was disbanded. So I, I don't know about logging foam cement. It's just so low density sometimes that it's, you know, but it's nitrogen and cement, it goes everywhere. Well, and that's the problem is people won't do it because people say, gee, we don't know if it works. And there's a dozen wells out there that have been foam cemented that work just fine. Actually, I would say there are, there's been some recent extensive work with foam cement. It may answer some of the questions that you have, Lou. Um, I need to figure out, I, there was a, I think it was a government lab that did extensive uh, testing on the foam cement as far as mechanical yeah. properties. But was that? Yeah, I've got her name. So there's extensive data out there to uh, help guarantee it. I know about the bonding, the, the measurement of the cement bond and a bond log. It really, we have a bond log. Where's our, my Dutch friend? Yeah. Yes, Derek. Uh, there are techniques. Um, they're more statistical than absolute value to detect the presence of foam cement. But you have to know that a conventional CBL won't find it. But proper techniques of that CBL, same CBL log, can be used to see it very, very clearly. So there are th those techniques out there available. We just need to know about them and, and utilize them. So yes, it's hard to find, but, but we can find it with the right techniques. Yeah. Okay. So that was half of the deal. Yeah. And the other half is, is, is trying to convince people to reverse circulate cement is very difficult for me. And I'm a true believer in it. I've only done three or four jobs myself, but I know another fellow, a good friend of mine, who's done a dozen of them and they work really good. And I think that that's something that maybe that's another workshop topic, topic because we're talking about cement placement tomorrow morning, but we're not talking about mechanical placement. Go ahead, Lou. And I know Mark's done a bunch of jobs reverse, right, Mark? Yeah. Well, you know, the good thing about foam cement, it's like the insulation they put in these walls. You know, it, it expands like crazy and it'll fill every gap and everything. But I'm not really sure how we can evaluate it in a, in a bond log. I mean, I can run a bond log on a well and I can have I can have five different people give me an interpretation. I'm going to have five different answers in many cases, you know, it, it, it's just, I'm not getting a good valuation. I don't think as well as, as, as I would like to see and as early conventional cement. Tell me, tell me about it. 
So, yeah, so I've looked at a lot of logs, um, both foam, uh, of course, most conventional cement. Right. It's not as easy um, to look at um, at foam cement job because it, it it is a mixture of air and, 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 and solids. Yeah. If you take a conventional CBL, it looks at a such a large uh, area that you basically get an average. So if you have air plus solid, you get a liquid. If you go ultrasonic, where you can look at square inches, then it's a lot easier to see where you have, okay, I see areas of cement, areas of gas. So that is where the, 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 uh, the, the, the right. foam is placed. And, and sometimes you see that the foam has risen up. It has migrated through it to a higher section. So it's where it's accumulated and, and, and that you can recognize on the thing. So it's, it's not, like you said, it's not easy to see, but it is, you can, you can look at the logs. Now, well, as it comes to compressive strength, that's the basis of a regular CBL. That compressive strength is low. Um, but if, if somebody has uh, results which are different, then please feel free to, to correct me. Well, CBL is nothing but a sonic log. I mean, you, we're looking to, we're, we're, we're trying to ring the bell and see if, if we get a thud, you know? I mean, basically what it is. And if, and if I mix the cement with a lot of air or foam, whatever it's kind of mixed with, sometimes vapor and gas and nitrogen, uh, it, is it going to give me a different ring? So um, CBL is, like you said, it's ringing a pipe. Whereas yeah. if you look at ultrasonic, you try to resonate the casing yeah. on very small areas, and there will be a different ring if there is a gas behind it or a liquid sure. or a solid. Sure. And that's what you have to look at, at these statistical variations, as Daniel mentioned earlier. And is it easy to tell the difference between the bonding of the semen and the casing and semen and the and the formation? Uh, you only with most... Uh, logs. What you see is you look at the at the contact. The, in the 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 contact was directly behind the casing. So that will be your uh, casing cement interface. Same as casing cement contact. That's right. Correct. All right. Thanks. That's the final statement. All right. Um, I, I had one other quick comment, and then maybe Mark, Mark because we have to uh, with foam cement, you have to not believe what you see. You have to believe what you calculate. Seriously, because when the foam cement comes back to surface, Mark, you and I have both been on jobs where it just it's spraying all over the place. And how in the world could that have any strength? But when you do the calculations, the the expansion factor of, of compressed gas, 100 standard cubic feet per barrel it, uh, under 3000 PSI is gives you a foam quality of maybe 15 percent. But when it comes back to surface, it's like 1500 percent. So you have to realize when you're cement remains under pressure behind the casing, you're not getting shaving cream behind the pipe. It's, it's actually a cement system that has uh, a gas fraction that's plus or minus 30%. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I totally agree. The other thing too is there's, there's two benefits of foam. Uh, one is it's, it's ductile properties. And in geothermal settings, I think that's important to have. And secondly, I cannot think of any better way of a bonding system than an energized or a foam application because you're basically holding pressure constantly on that. And really in terms of trying to lighten the cement slurry, you're only adding nitrogen, a little bit of soap. If you try to accomplish the same thing with other products, you're adding water and fluffy stuff. Yeah, well, and glass beads too, but essentially I, I think foam was a great application. And as far as this, the bond log evaluation the pulse type tools have a much better way of determining that jeffrey you had some comment well we we started with susan and she was asking you know a question about testing and capabilities and reverse cementing and the different techniques that are out there right and uh, the the answer is yes we have the capabilities to test at very very high pressures and very very high temperatures right and uh well, several people have said, you know, we need to talk and reach out for help because those capabilities do exist and they may not exist everywhere. Uh, but uh, I can definitely test to above 400 C uh, scenarios. I can test up to 40,000 PSI. 
I can do rheologies at these temperatures and pressures, right? Um, which are dynamic. And when you talk about the modeling, you talk about how we want to look and see how geothermal well placement is, right? You're going to have to evaluate it outside the normal API requirements and, and, and just say, hey, that was for an industry that's not me. <laughs> oh, you know, we're like oil and gas, but we're different. And say, these are the parameters I'm worried about. You know, we, let's go out and get that data. And it can be done. Um, and reaching out uh, in, in for help in the industry, I think, is important. And, and knowing that there are solutions and there's our modeling capabilities. And we don't just assume that it's just too hot. Because, uh, you know, high temperature cementing is maybe not as common this day and age. But, you know, it wasn't long ago uh, when you would have or 500 degree wells. They still happen, but uh, you know, even inside uh, Slumberjay, we have non-commercial high temperature additives we just don't use because nobody wants them, right? But uh, they're out there. And so, uh, you know, don't worry about asking some questions because their help is there, I think. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'd like to last uh, comment from Raphael before. We... And as we're getting to that, I just also want to add that in addition to temperatures that uh, maybe scale of this testing is also important. So if you look at the uh, oil and gas, since this is a GRC SP, they, you know, they test things at scale before going for a field trial and full application. So uh, how is that going to be done for geothermal wells, I think is something that it is there has a question. All right, just to add a little bit regarding uh, foam cementing and uh, evaluation. If you use an ultrasonic tool, and if you can appreciate that most foam cement systems have an acoustic impedance very similar to water or gas, depending on the density, yeah, you won't be able to tell what's the difference between gas, water, or cement. But if you do run a uh, an analysis of variance or uh, some kind of statistical variance plot, you can tell the difference between the systems. Now, as far as bonding, the fact that it's energized, like Mark mentioned, the fact that it has a very high apparent viscosity, and the fact that it has surfactants, it makes it uh, inherently water wetting. Uh, the fact that it expands minimizes shrinkage, the infamous 2% shrinkage of, of uh, Portland that we all mentioned. So I think it's a very viable system, reversed or conventionally pumped. So uh, those are basically uh, one of well, the one thing I'll, I'll add that from a compressive strength perspective, you're adding gas, arguably inert. So your water and solids ratio is remaining the same. So yes, you're losing compressive strength, but you're also lowering Young's modulus and enhancing other mechanical properties. Thanks, Rafael. So just because time, we'll move to the second session that we had. Thanks for all the discussion. Appreciate that very much. Appreciate that very much. Uh, now, the second session that we had was specifically on slurry blends. So the three discussions there were a review of thermally responsive cement case studies, number one. The second was the hexagonal boron nitride reinforced multifunctional cement for extreme environments. And the third one was mitigating strength retrogradation or retrogression using tailored cement design. And I think so the same questions that I asked earlier would be apl applicable here too. So I again invite the audience to join the discussion. So this was specifically on slurry bends. <laughs> Anybody to start the discussion? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Um, so the hexagonal nature of the boron nitrogen additives, uh, is the performance dependent on that form or do other forms of boron nitride, for example, um, impart the same type of properties? 
No, the hexagonal uh, form is the allotrope that is the best, and those properties come from this allotrope. Others, there is cubic boronitide, but doesn't that doesn't work as good as this one? Okay, and then beyond the allotrope forms, um, we're aware of different types of tubes or structures made from boronitride. Have you looked into any of these as well? Yes, those are uh, more expensive. Let's say boronitride nanotubes. Mm -hmm. Nanotubes inherently are more expensive to make, whether carbon nanotubes or boronitride nanotubes, those are expensive. Okay, so the only difference would be a cost. Yeah. In your view. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Okay, one question. One general comment that may relate to the previous session to maybe this session as well, that we talked about this, uh, you know, the risk to apply these different technologies in the field. Are there possibilities that before going to the field that let's say a, a client owns, they, maybe they don't want to risk to apply a new technology in the field because there is a, too much liability for them. Are there possibilities like a test bed that somebody can make and maybe a consortium type thing that uh, maybe one elbow, let's say 100 meters uh, or maybe shorter, 50 meters uh, hole plus like a small elbow so that placement can be monitored. And then people can put their different technology in there to see how the placement works and how the properties, maybe a little bit, you know, leakage testing, pressure, you know, to, to see if there is a pressure drop, if you pressurize it on the top. Something like this could be like a, maybe it's mimicking a standardization, but there is no standard. Or maybe when a small hole somewhere in that uh, can be like possibility for the loss circulation, somebody wants to evaluate. I know it is difficult, but just throwing the idea that is there a way like a, a small scale setup that people can test different technologies so that uh, you don't go to the client to risk the whole well and then come up with their the technology work or not. But I understand that the difficulty might be that every time that cement is set, then removing it from the same test bed is a challenge. Maybe somehow, I don't know, maybe some acids that's gonna eat away this, that's maybe hydrochloric acid or something that's gonna remove that cement so that a new technology can be used the same condition, same elbow. But uh, you know, just throwing an idea. I think uh, one of the things if I may just add to that is normally I know Halliburton or Baker or Slumberger normally have test wells where you all test your technologies, your designs and your processes. I think so that's one of the places where, because again, it comes to who will bear the cost. That's the biggest question here. We can do the testing, but who will bear the cost? But if there's something that's already available, like a test well that they use for testing all the tools, I think that's a place where if both, you know, the operators and the contractors come together, that could be a place where you could test these materials. But again, one thing comes there, who is going to benefit out of this? You know, it should not again be just limited to, okay, like, for example, Billy from Cal Energy tested this at Halliburton. So it remains between them. That's the end of this story. It should not be that way. It should be, if you are developing something, that should be something that should be passed on to the industry as a whole so that you're learning from things. Yes, Jen. I just have a general comment. Um, several very interesting products and systems were in, in their commercial products um, were presented. And I just wanted to encourage myself and others who find ourselves in kind of a neutral corner in a, in a consulting or whatever role to be uh, uh, enthusiastic supporters of new ideas and keep a short list of these systems and materials. So that as we go out and work on different projects, we go, hey, you know, I remember such and such was mentioned I could find out or, or maybe provide that as an opportunity. I know there's a lot of good research being done and there's a lot of, uh, but in order for more good research being done, those products have to be field tested. So um, there's several of us in here and, and you know who you are <laughs> that could help be champions of new ideas to have them tested. And uh, you know, not everything works, but, and I know they're very risk averse, but there's almost no downside to trying any of these new products that were shared today. And they they can only provide benefit. And I'm sure there's also discounts that can be provided by these companies, possibly to make it more uh, palatable or whatever to get to be a first timer. But we need to encourage each other to be champions of new ideas. And so. just to add to that, you know, when I was, when I used to work on the operator side, 
there were many a times, for example, PDC bits were never tried in the geothermal industry. And that's the times when a couple of the service companies came and told, okay, Sam, can you try this in your well? We'll take the risk. If it works, you make a payment. If it doesn't work, it's a learning curve. That's a place where probably it could be you test some new technology or test some new product. If it works, it works. But then again, there's a cost sharing and the implications that are associated with it. Anyway, you had a question or some comment? No, no I'm just uh, okay. agreeing. So I guess, are we going to ask if Halliburton and Schlumberger are going to volunteer the testing wells <laughs> for new materials? Good question. <laughs> they don't drill wells. They, they don't drill wells. <laughs> uh, test wells? I was talking about test wells. Yeah. I'll say one thing. I think, you know, from the operator standpoint, really, I think it affects the whole geothermal community, even worldwide, is that so many fields only drill maybe, you know, in our case, maybe one well a year, right? So all eyes are on this. There's not multiple wells to be drilled to test a lot of different things. Maybe Indonesia right now where there's a lot of wells being drilled or other places or maybe with new development when there's a, you know, tan well program. But I do see that as you know, so many, so many operators are just drilling either with workovers or just really it's the number of wells are so low. I think that that affects really R&D just in general for geothermal. Thank you. Susan. Well, the number of wells we drill each year is definitely low and we don't want to risk those wells for testing new technology. Sorry. But that said, we do oftentimes have idle wells that we aren't using or that we're using for monitoring or that we might want to use in the future, but we aren't using right this second. And if we could come up with protocols to test some of these things in those wells, I, and I don't know what exactly that would look like, but that's something we would definitely entertain. Like I had a well that um, we couldn't use because it had, it was an injector and it had a zone at the bottom that was like super, super permeable, giant open cracks. And we tried to cement up the bottom of that well to plug it off, to be able to inject in the rest of the borehole, which wasn't as permeable, but didn't connect up with, we hoped with our producers as much. So when we did that, I don't know where that cement went, but it's gone. <laughs> we can't ever find it again. But you know, if somebody has an idea for a, a lightweight cement or some kind of way that they that would that might work better, then I'm in. You know, we, we can't use that well the way it is now. So I, you know, I'd be willing to test somebody's new idea in that realm. And then there's other wells, like uh, wells where I might like to say cement a scab liner into the open hole so that I can isolate zones, right? Well, okay, contest your cement in that kind of situation. Because if it fails, you know, it, it's not really that important that it lasts forever. Um, and, and we can just pull that little piece of casing out and do something else. Um, so, so I think approaching, if you have ideas about something that might work, approaching those of us who have high temperature wells and asking, uh, can I test this? And, and, you know, assuming that there'll be some kind of cost share, if I have to do something to that well anyway, and I'm going to test your new product, I might be willing to do cost share. Otherwise, you know, I might say, hey, you can try it and um, it's on you and I don't care if it doesn't work. So, you know, I mean, there are these opportunities and, and ask us because there's a lot of idle geothermal wells out there, believe me. Thanks, Susan. I think so. Just as a follow up, what Susan was just mentioning, I see a question over here from the chat is that you know, she was just mentioning she would like to give you guys a chance to use your concepts in her well. And the question here is, are there any time estimates for getting proof of concept uses in the field on real geothermal wells of these new additives or concepts? So the person here is asking, Olivier Coker is asking is, do you have any time concepts that you have for going from on paper research 
to a proof of concept in a well? Any takers? Uh, I'm going to start on this. Uh, just noticing in like um, oil and gas research. Uh, recently, DOE is really funding much more readily those projects that have uh, access to uh, wells and field uh, kind of testing. So that's one opportunity, maybe one way to get to pay for, for testing uh, materials in real wells. Take us for giving a time frame. Just uh, you know, it doesn't have to be hours, minutes, any even months or a year. How much time do you will take from going to a stage of research to a stage of proof of concept? We can rephrase it like: When would you trust this new product that you would be willing to uh, apply it in your well? Geothermal okay. drilling completions. <laughs> I think it depends really on the, the organization and the type of research that's being done leading from conception to commercialization. But I don't think of it as much as a timetable, as much as let's say the quality of the verification and the validation, and then the subsequent commercialization steps. So you have to go through and make sure that we're, we're organized and that you have your requirements intact, you know how you want to apply to the operation and that you're solid in your validation. And once that takes place, that could really take anywhere between months to years, right. depending on the type of technology. Yeah. But it comes down to alignment on these requirements, moving through these steps the right way, proving in trials. Uh, it's more of a stage process than a time process. Thank you. I appreciate that. Caitlin, before we move on to the next session. Uh, thank you. I think that um, we need um, to look a little bit back to oil and gas and to learn from there. Um, a lot of things that has been done in oil and gas is products that go down the hole has been intensively tested prior going down the hole. And that gives you a little bit uh, more security that they will never fail there. Um, in geothermal, if you look around, we have very few, um, you know, testing uh, capabilities, especially for high temperature. Daniel mentioned again, uh, high temperature of cement and so on. And that's one of the direction we should uh, uh, go. Of course, there is some funding and we have that DOE, for example, uh, started to fund uh, some projects where we are developing some testing standards that are capable of that. But uh, we need to, uh, you know, advertise them and to let people know that, uh, you know, these capabilities exist and that's the way you do. You put in the well something that has survived in a testing lab first. That's the critical key. Thank you. Sorry, one more question. Ah, sorry. So I'm in the research uh, sector of the uh, operating company. So we are constantly being tasked with this uh, going from research to uh, deployment and right. then field test. And so what I would like to point out that the main, uh, the, in order to say like, okay, this takes like certain time frame, it's all about communication. And uh, we all know that it's a risky business. And we understand that, uh, you know, everybody is uh, risk averse and they don't want to put new materials in their well, because even with the known materials, you never know what you are going to encounter uh, deep into the well. So uh, the main thing is do as much testing as possible and also like uh, trying to prove and trying to get them to uh, believe in the new products. It can be very variable. It can be like we have seen from one year to five years. Thank you. I think uh, Lou has Sorry, one, one more. comment. Thanks, Aparita, for that. I get, the, I get the last word here. Okay. The wells of opportunity have just about dried up because nowadays everybody's going for profits, right? And as in an excess of a thousand rigs running in the United States right now, how many are working for geothermal? Maybe half a dozen. The research dollar is not going to go to the half a dozen. It's going to go to the other hundred thousand wells that are out there. So we've got to be able to um, take advantage of any opportunity we possibly can to take a look at some of these things, uh, whether it be a well of opportunity or wells that, that are, uh, are not going to be productive anymore that we can run them in. Like Susan said, some, you know, wells that you're not going to damage and, and hurt production for good, but we're going to have to be able to find some of these wells, some test wells that we can start using these tests on. 
but uh, you know the, the the research dollars are going to oil and gas, and geothermal's got to be able to provide the information to how to test this stuff to, to for high temperature. Thanks, Lou. That's it. Thank you. And I think so. You know, just to finish off with what Abrita was saying, there is Sorry, there's always a risk involved, and sometimes it is how risk averse are you? You know, we do see the Powerball coming you, up Roger. every weekend or every two weekends, and the Powerball goes up because people are ready to bet more. But how many of us buy the Powerball Powerball tickets? That's number one. And then how many of us win on it? I think if you were winning it, some of us wouldn't be here. So, you know, there's a risk involved, but there's also a reward in that, but depends on how, what is our appetite for risk to take? So with that, as I go to the last session that we had, so we had was high temperature and high pressure cements. So the three uh, topics that were to be spoken, one was what uh, Daniel spoke about cement replacement for high pressure, high temperature stress applications, number one. Then the other two papers were that were not presented, but are evaluation of cement and casing and cement rock integrity. Okay, fine. And the third speaker was uh, Mr. Ma Ma Martino, right? Martino. Yeah, Martino, he'll be presenting after we finish this. He's talking about non Portland cement slurries and application of ultra high temperature geothermal wells with super critical conditions. I think so, you know, that is where now we are going into the easiest realm of things where we are using super critical CO2 and other stuff. So again, I would like to uh, get the audience involved in this before we uh, give the stage to the third presenter. I think this is opportunity for more questions to Daniel on the sand event. Or anybody has Does any it comments? only work with silica or, or, or you could do this with different type of sand? So the existing system is with silica sand. So that's it. But I mean, who's to say you couldn't do it with something different? But I, right now I don't in no, I mean, it the silica system provides a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, covers a lot of bases. So. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, Susan's question about the solubility maybe could be addressed by changing the chemistry of the water phase. They just didn't think about it for oil and gas applications. So I don't know, Susan, is there anything we could do to slow down the solubility, add salt to it or? And, you know, if you chemically treat it, there's no telling how long it's going to stay in that solution and dissolve, go somewhere else. That's the problem. So at really high temperatures, silica doesn't dissolve as well. Ah. But um, so, so if you get up above, I think it's like 550 F, oh. it, it becomes less, less soluble. So it's got retrograde solubility. Right. But this pressure solubility thing, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. think requires. Yeah. It's, it's probably going to solubilize. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our experiments and testing with using silica sand as a propent in geothermal showed that it dissolved. Yeah. And I mean, we tried it at a range of temperatures that are, that would work at up to 300 C and it just dissolves. But, <laughs> so. but that would be with a lot of water flowing through it. Well, right. that's true. It was doing that. Yeah. yeah. So, and this is just a certain amount. So maybe after the water reaches saturation with silica, maybe it stops. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a good question and need yeah, to be is. addressed for HPHC applications. That's right. That's yeah. right. Any other? Anybody else wanting to contribute or any suggestions? Uh, uh. So I think I'm going to then just leave it to the other sponsor to read that question. The question here is there was one question back from Olivier Coker. 
the ad loop being played at breaks or oh, includes us secretary and offering research money for geothermal so i think his question is is there research money for geothermal available i think we'll look for it if we get it we'll pass it to everybody we'll share it there was just an announcement from <laughs> ah okay well you know the the video showed that they're asking for 57 million dollars for next year and we we were around that little less, less than that this year. So they are trying to put money into that research area. Yeah. Great. That's in geothermal oil and gas get quite a bit more, but anyway, Okay. Uh, I think that concludes it. And I want to thank everybody, our Melinda and, 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 and our, our moderators here on this section. I think we've got a very diverse group of people. They've got excellent questions and we've got excellent subjects and we and I think we've we've had a good day today. I'd like to take just this one quick opportunity to thank our sponsors. Our gold sponsors are Geo Drilling Fluids and Baker Hughes. Our uh, silver sponsors are Lehigh Hansen and Halliburton and Slumberjay and uh, Circ Energy. And uh, our bronze sponsors, uh, CERC Energy and um, Resource Group uh, for the bronze and, and the reception, uh, as well as Kenai Drilling, uh, Paul Graham Drilling, Resource Cementing, and uh, a small company called Capiano Engineering. Did write a lot of work, you know. And so um, we thank you all. We thank you all for being here. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And uh, Enjoy the reception tonight, uh, and and Jeff's going to wrap it up. All right. Well, we just want to uh, announce some schedule changes for tomorrow before we get to our last and final presentation. So after I'm done talking, don't run away. So the afternoon coffee break, we're going to shorten that up by 15 minutes. And then we are going to move session seven ahead by 15 minutes. You can uh, pick up the, so that's going to start at 2.45. You can pick up a revised agenda out at the front desk there. With that, we're going to be able to move session eight from Saturday to tomorrow afternoon. We're going to go with that from nope. Uh, 16, so 4.15 to 6 o'clock. That's going to finish off session eight. And uh, then the reception, which was going to be at 4.30 going to 6, is going to go from 6 to 7.30 out in the courtyard. So today's reception is in the courtyard. Tomorrow's reception is in the courtyard. And I just want to thank uh, Geothermal Resource Group for sponsoring both of those receptions. So thank you very much. With that, I will turn it back over to uh, to Sam to introduce our last uh, speaker of the day, and uh, then we'll get on to the evening festivities. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Lou, for that, for the word of thanks and for the program for tomorrow. So with, without taking too much of time, we've got our third speaker for the evening, Martin, Martin no? Martino, if hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. So his topic is non-Portland cement slurry development and application for ultra high temperature geothermal well with supercritical condition. I will hand over the mic to him. Uh, please give a small buy intro of yourself and you can go ahead with the paper. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Just one second and I will share my screen. Yes, please. There you go. Good to go. Okay, well, so good afternoon all. I'm a senior technical professional uh, for cementing product service line group at Halliburton. And today I'm going to present you a case history of non-Portland cement slurry applied for an ultra high temperature geothermal well with supercritical conditions. Here we go. So 
the European Commission supported projects uh, within the Horizon 2020 program, uh, driven by one of the Horizon 2020 supported projects, drilling in deep supercritical ambient of continental Europe, a suitable cement slurry had to be selected as an integral part of the effort to drill, evaluate and complete an ultra high temperature geothermal well, Benelle 2. The scope of the project meant to drill into the continental crust with the targeted K horizon represents a transition between old and new, where an aggressive environment with high temperature and pressure from deep fluid is expected. Fluids that uh, had not been previously characterized regarding physiochemical aspects and supercritical conditions were assumed to be present. So new wells drilled or existing wells extended into the K, the K horizon have depths of uh, approximately 3,000, 3,500 meters and correspond to temperatures that can exceed 450 Celsius and 250 bar, where fluids will be supercritical and under these conditions, regular cementing operations have not been conducted with the goal to achieve the long-term integrity. A su successful drilled and completed well could support future production of geothermal energy from geothermal fields that this could sustain and possibly increasing the annual output of low carbon emission electrical energy. The current uh, recommended silica concentration based on the maximum achieved temperature are presented here. These are guidelines based on the variability of cement composition and additive interaction. As bottom static temperature increases, the ability of Portland cement to provide the necessary mechanical properties begins to diminish. Therefore, it becomes necessary to evaluate non-Portland materials like calcium aluminate phosphate designs to achieve stability in high temperature conditions even though retardation of slurries is a complex task. So since the project was uh, situated in a well-known geothermal area where, where wells have, have been drilled for more than 100 years, it was decided to use two-phase approach. Phase one, was to be an assessment of known cement slurries used to cement geothermal and or high pressure, high temperature wells. And based upon the results of phase one, phase two was the optimization of the design deemed best suitable for the expected well scenario. So a Portland design, uh, it was a, a ready mix blend of API class G and silica flower 40% by weight of cement was evaluated as a representation of, of existing cemented string, strings and API class G Portland cement with additional 70% by weight of cement silica and a calcium aluminate phosphate design were evaluated as the candidates for deeper sections. While the, two, while the first two options are of a common design with known behavior, the latter has different characteristics when compared to Portland-based design. Calcium phosphate cement slurry, calcium aluminate phosphate cement slurries have better resistance to temperature and corrosive environments, such as the expected CO2 content of the reservoir fluids, but require special handling during placement operations due to strong adverse effect when contaminated. All the three cement slurry design were prepared according to the section 3.4 of the API recommended the practice 10B2. Samples were then cured in an autoclave at the estimated placement temperature of 199 Celsius 
a two and 206 bar for seven days using a temperature and, per and pressure scheduled as simulated for the, for the well by the client, followed by the three day ramp down to ambient conditions. A second cured set was dried in a vacuum for approximately three weeks at 50 degrees Celsius with the nitrogen gas sweep and then exposed to 450 50 Celsius for seven days to simulate well bore temperatures. After maintaining isothermal conditions at 450 Celsius for seven days, temperature was decreased back to ambient in about one and a half days. So after curing at 450 Celsius, many of the samples spacements were visibly cracked and broken from the local HD blend with 40% silica to 70% silica. Subsequent CT scans and of apparently intact spacements uh, revealed that almost all cylindrical samples had internal fractures despite drying prior to heating. Possible causes include stress induced by temperature change vaporization of fluid in trapped pore and shrinkage. Chemical stability of the samples was analyzed to give insight into potential causes of the cracks. X-ray fluorescence was conducted on the three designs before and after exposure up to 450 Celsius. The oxide content in is similar for all three slurries, suggesting no alterations in, in the elemental composition of the slurries. To understand the presence of refractory materials, the compressive strength of calcium aluminate phosphate design samples after exposure to 450 Celsius was measured despite the presence of visible cracks in the spacements. It was reasoned that this would be an estimate of the minimal strength as samples free of cracks would have higher strength. As was observed, the control and high temperature cured spacement had comparable compressive strength values, which suggested that properties for the calcium aluminate phosphate design could be retained upon exposure to 450 Celsius. To reveal the morphology and explain these properties, scanning electron mi microscopy SEM was performed on sections of semen samples before and after exposure to 450 Celsius. At low magnification, the local ready mix blend of API class G and silica at 40% by weight of cement revealed a cross section with few structure on the order of 10 micron or larger that could be pores. At high magnification, there appeared angular particle less than 200 mesh, particle size of the quartz silica that was what was included in the blend. In contrast, after exposure to 450 Celsius for seven days, the structure appeared to be more porous. The API class G with 70% of silica added was similar and had very few structures on the order of 10, 10, 10 micron or larger that could be porous. There were no regular spherical structure at higher magnification similar to the ones seen in the local ready to mix blend API class G plus 40% silica. In, in contrast, the calcium aluminate phosphate semen sample remained similar in appearance before and after exposure to 450 Celsius for seven days. Some voids were present, which were attributed to possibly entrained air because of the slurry being much more viscous than the Portland designs. The calcium aluminate phosphate system retained some significant properties, lower, perme lower permeability, crash strength, attributed to the formation of refractory materials, 
still major challenges of, of well and formation knowledge persisted after phase one due to limitation in testing. Which finding of phase one and the actual drilling operation, up, drilling operation approaching, it was decided to make phase two a combination of the continuation of the cement slurry evaluation and an optimization of the slurry for practical application. Calcium aluminate phosphate, being the best survivor in phase one, was selected with no limitations of the calcium aluminate phosphate system. A decision was made to conduct all thickening time tests at 200, 200 Celsius. This was determined after temperature simulations of the planet drilling operations proved that this temperature can be achieved at the time of cement placement. During the optimization, it was deemed necessary that the behavior of non-polymer non -polyper, polymer stabilizer in the design at test conditions needed to be mapped, especially regarding viscosity at surface as well as in downhill conditions. Mixability, viscosity, and pumpability of the slurry depend on delayed dehydration of, non, of the non-polymer stabilizer, while the heat exposure will contract thermal thinning and stabilize the slurry downhole. This resulted not only in an ideal concentration, but also in a recommended mixing procedure. Retarded response, Retarded response testing showed that an early stage that with the temperatures higher than 200 Celsius, the necessary thickening time to safely pump a cement slurry downhole could barely be achieved. Sensitivity testing up to 250 Celsius ended in a non-placeable slurry regardless of the retarded concentration. Hence, 200 Celsius was set a limiting value for BHCT, bottom of circulating temperature. Retarded concentration was selected to balance the risk of inadequate thickening time if the temperature is higher than the anticipated 200 Celsius with reasonable strength development. Pre-job circulation was required to achieve an artificial bottom of circulating temperature so that the cement slurry temperature was not exposed to temperature above that value during placement. For risk assessment, sensitivity tests were run up to 220 degrees Celsius. In phase two, pre-exposure curing had been revisited since phase one curing conditions were not ideal and spaceman damage during curing was related to a, a, to a not fit for purpose procedure. Absence of a permanent contact to water and two short heat ramps were two factors discussed and criticized. Specimens dried, dry cured still showed cracks However, wet and wet dry cured specimen did not show damage. You can see the, the, the change in color during dry curing exposed to air. Mechanical properties testing was performed on pre-final blend specimens. Otherwise, the long curing period would have delayed the actual operation. Operational tests were conducted with the uh, actual materials used for the job and additionally a suitable spacer was designed for the expected placement temperature. Engineering of the cement job followed known processes. Nevertheless, the high temperature present in this project required an extra focus on temperature related topics. Achieving the artificial bottom all circulating temperature of 200 Celsius was one item, but equipment used to secure the overall cement job had to be assessed, had to be assessed to such as a liner hanger equipment, cementing plugs, and spacer chemistry. 
Using an industry proven temperature simulation software, the target of an artificial bottom hole circulating temperature was approached by altering mud inlet temperature and circulating rate. After the drilling operation commenced, it was noticed that with the given mud pit volume, a proper mud cooling system was necessary to obtain a practical inlet temperature and circulating rate, circulation rate. Also, intermediate circulation phases were required during the liner running operations to keep the well bore circula circulation fluid at the manage manageable temperature. So the actual job execution was not much different than a regular cement procedure. Uh, root cause uh, is, of course, the engineering and the job planning work, uh, which went parallel to the slurry design work, with all the equipment sanitized and dedicated for this special job, and all possible contaminants guaranteed. The crew could perform the liner job, the liner cementing job, according to the program. Of course, an additional watch was kept on the mud system to ensure temperature value at the inlet much at the desired average mud inlet temperature. A check of the third party's liner hanger and uh, its auxiliary equipment resulted in the need for a job redesign with the bottom of cigarette temperature increasing to more than 250 Celsius during the liner hanger set and the release procedure it was deemed the condition too far deviating from the manufacturer temperature ratings for the cementing plug set. No separation between cement slurry and fluids before and after results in high risk of cement slurry contamination. The use of foam rubber balls as a separator was discussed but was also seen to, as too risky. Final risk mitigation result, resulted in an extra cement volume and a certain under displacement. The latter was also due to no indication of when the tail end of the cement slurry will arrive at the float collar. Overall cementing operations at the project resulted in demonstrating that despite the challenging condition regarding temperature and pressure of this geothermal exploration well, a satis satisfactory solution could be provided. While the initial evaluation using a leak of test of the calcium aluminate phosphate cement slurry design proved the, to be the right selection, the long-term results are outstanding as the exploration well is currently temporarily plugged to evaluate the ge geothermal reservoir. Thank you. Clean presentation. Any questions from the audience, please? Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I think you showed earlier that the calcium aluminum phosphate cement, uh, the placement temperature was limited to 275 degrees Fahrenheit. But then uh, later on, you showed results with the uh, retarder concentration. I was wondering, could you pull that slide back up and zoom in? The, I. I what? I was just curious about that data that you presented, and I couldn't uh, see any of the numbers. Do you, do you know which slide I'm talking about? Uh, just let me check. Okay. Uh, you mean this one? Uh, could you please share uh, your screen share, back? You have to share your screen. Thanks. Uh, no, it, it, it's further back. Where, where you mentioned the retarder concentration, controlling okay. the thickening time. Let me check. No, just one second, please. This yeah, one? Right there. Yeah, that. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's any way to zoom in. 
Okay. Uh, just maybe, maybe maybe you could just talk through the the data points or what you're showing. Okay. Uh, so so basically, uh, uh, okay. Uh, this is the basically the concentration of the of the retarder both uh, FA2 and HR25, the high temperature retarder. So on uh, on uh, on this case, um, you can see here that uh, okay, this is the temperature on the right side. You can see the download thickening time uh, to 50 BC. So basically, with uh, with uh, with the temperature at uh, basically the maximum temperature at 250 Celsius. So we measure at a thickening time of uh, even I mean a thickening time of about three hours. You see here on the left side. That, that answers okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Martino. No problem. Okay. Uh, and what was the green is the healing the, time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, green is the healing time. This is the time to 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 fifty BC, uh, and this is the temperature basically. So is that the set time, or the setting time, Martino? The, the green one. The, 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 the no, the the green one is is basically the the. This is the, the the heating time. I mean, the the ramp that we we use to to perform the test in the thickening time. Uh, you you have to use you, at this temperature. You have to use uh, uh, the um, I mean the the heating time, which is not uh, fifty minutes or or, uh, or one hour. It's more than one hour, so it's two hour to to let to let the slurry uh, become hot and uh, without any damage of the equipment. We have. Oh. Uh, one more question uh, was, where was this well drilled? Uh, what country in Europe? Uh, Italy. was okay. drilled in, in Tuscany. Nice location. Excellent. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Test well. I'm volunteering to go there. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other questions? One sec, Martino. One more question, please. So, um, was this a long string? Was this back to surface? Uh, see again, please. Was this cemented back to surface? Yes, was uh, okay. The, the liner was cementing, and after that, with the same slurry design, uh, with the same, the same uh, calcium phosphate uh, aluminate cement, uh, was cemented with uh, two, two tie backs to surface. Then was cemented to surface, yes. After, after retarding to these temperatures, uh, how long does it take the cement to set? at the lower temperatures when it's cemented back to the top of the casing? <laughs> Good question. I mean, we, uh, we decreased the retarder uh, at the minimum concentration, but uh, the time to set the cement, uh, and that was discussed with the customer, uh, at surface it was about uh, 36 hours. Okay. I think that was all the questions that we had for Martino. Uh, thank you, Martino, for your time. And let's thank give you. a round of applause. Thank you. All right, just one final announcement. Breakfast is going to be served inside the lobby tomorrow morning because of the high probability of rain. So don't be wandering around outside in the rain looking for food. Come inside. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, reception starts at five o'clock tonight, so you have about a half an hour before that begins. Thanks a lot, oh, Paul, for your time. The reception's okay. just out in the courtyard. There was a question about where that was. Same place you've been getting food all day. Go there. <laughs>